you know, keep your platform flat. If it really gets windy, they'll drag behind you and it turns the boat perpendicular to the waves. Now you can't roll over, capsize. That's real dangerous in high seas. One atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hovind, I heard your seminar about Noah's Ark having rocks hanging all over the side. He said, you are so stupid. Don't you know if he had rocks hanging all over the boat, it would slow him down? <laughs> I wrote back and said, where was he going? <laughs> He's not trying to go anywhere. He's just trying to float. Brother, and I'm stupid, yeah. I debated a former preacher turned atheist. And he said, you can't build a boat more than 300 feet long because it'll break going over the waves. He said, they built a ship one time that had six masts, you know, a six-master. And, the, you know, the tw it twisted the boat so bad it leaked all the time. They finally had to give it up. Noah's Ark didn't have any masts. Hello, it's designed to float, not to sail. All right? <laughs> Probably a big barge of some kind. I don't know. He said, boat, you know, when the waves come up, it bends and breaks in the middle. Well, a lot of boats over 300 feet long have been built out of wood and survived. The Chinese had some really big ones many years ago, out of wood. Plus, if you put a moon pool in the boat, that solves the problem. A moon pool is a hole in the floor with walls up on the inside, of course, so the boat doesn't sink. And as, the, as you go over the waves, this relieves the stress. Now the water com actually comes up inside the boat partway. A moon pool is a pretty cool idea. As the water goes up and down in that hole, it would be relieving the stress. A great place to dump your garbage, too, by the way, inside the boat, out of the rain. Thirdly, it acts like a giant piston to pump fresh air in and out of the boat every time you hit a wave. Uh, remember what he had in the basement? You might pray for a good wave once in a while. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, when the dinosaurs got off the ark, what happened to them? If the Bible story is true, as I say that it is, Noah had to have dinosaurs on the ark, so what happened to them? What made the dinosaurs go extinct? That's a question they're always asking the kids in school. There are at least 16 theories floating around the textbooks. They'll say, kids, maybe a meteor struck the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago. Well, another guy from Indiana has got a cool theory. He says the dinosaurs killed themselves off with their own flatulence. <laughs> he said they couldn't stand the heat. I don't know what to do about a theory like that, but uh, what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Hey, uh, they're asking the wrong question. The question is not what made them go extinct. The question is, did they go extinct? You know, the liberals are really good at getting us to argue about the wrong topic. They're always asking me, should we teach creation in public schools? I said, that's a good question and I will be glad to discuss it. However, there's another question we need to ask first. Should we have public schools? Yeah, let's ask that one first. I praise God for the good, godly public school teachers. My mother was a public school teacher and retired. My brother's in his 34th year teaching public school. He led me to the Lord. There are many good, godly public school teachers, okay? But folks, the, work, the books they work from, the curriculum, is corrupt. Unfixable, I think. If you, if you love your kids and you possibly can, get them out. I don't think it's fixable. Praise God for the good teachers who are going to slug it out in there, and I'm for you, and I want to help. Okay, but I don't think it's fixable. Bottom line. If you want to find out why we have a public school system, our Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says the federal government's got no business being involved in education. But we've got a public school system as part of a bigger, long-range plan toward a new world order. And that's Karl Marx's idea, Communist Manifesto Plank Number 10, free public education. We'll cover more on that on uh, Seminar Part 5 and also on our college class, CSE 102. You don't want to watch that one. That's politically incorrect. Anyway. <clears throat> When the dinosaurs got off the ark, they faced a very hostile climate. Things had changed. Remember, before the flood, they lived over 900 years. After the flood, only 400, and then 200, and then 100. Something changed after the flood, folks. The canopy of water that used to protect them was gone. And you're not going to make it to 100, or 200 for sure. You might make it to 100, but you won't make it to 200. Not in this world. Dinosaurs had two serious problems after the flood. Number one, the climate was a lot different. They just couldn't live long enough to get big enough to reproduce in many cases. So some species probably went extinct in the first few generations. Second problem, I think, was worse. People hunted them. Back in those days, they called them dragons. They didn't call them dinosaur because the word dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841. So for most of human history, they called them dragons. Dragons are mentioned in the Bible 35 times. 
And as the population began to grow after the flood, the population of dragons began to go down because nobody wants to live next door to a dragon. <laughs> the same thing happened right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. How many grizzly bears are roaming loose in the woods in this county right here? Zero, right? How many grizzly bears were roaming around Milwaukee area 500 years ago? Probably a whole bunch of them. Well, what happened? As people move in and civilize an area, the big, dino, the big creatures, or ferocious creatures, are driven off or killed off. It happens all the time. If it came on the evening news tonight <clears throat> that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Milwaukee, Wisconsin, do you know what would happen by 6 o'clock in the morning? Every redneck in four counties would be out there with a rifle trying to shoot them. <laughs> right? <clears throat> and whoever could shoot the biggest one would be a hero. They'd put his picture in the paper. Hey, Bubba shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. <laughs> that's exactly what would happen. Well, that's what happened to the dragons. Man, if you could figure out a way to kill a dragon, you'd be a hero. They'd tell stories about you around the campfire for generations to come. And there are thousands of stories of people killing dragons. They killed them off for meat. There'd be a lot of hamburger in one brachiosaurus. They killed them for medicine. It's amazing how many ancient recipes call for dragon bones to be ground up and put in with the medicine. Lots of legends tell of people killing dragons. Gilgamesh supposedly slew a dragon. A Chinese guy named Yu slew dragons that were bothering them as they tried to expand the territory and drain off the swamps and make the land of China livable again. They had to drive off the snakes and dragons. The Babylonian god Marduk is shown pictured on top of a dragon, possibly a fire-breathing dragon. You say, oh, you don't believe in fire-breathing dragons, do you? Oh, yeah. The Bible talks about a fly, fiery flying serpent. The book of Job has a whole chapter, Job 41, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. It says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches. <laughs> As out of a seething pot or cauldron, his breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. There really was a fire-breathing dragon. In our green series of tapes, the topical ones, we've got a whole tape out there, hour and a half, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. If you get a Catholic Bible, you find the book of Daniel has two extra chapters, Daniel 13 and 14. It's part of the apocryphal books. It shouldn't be in Scripture. It's interesting reading, but it's not part of Scripture. It says, There was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, it means give me permission, O king, and I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder. What a strange story. Let me give you the Hoven translation of what's going on here. The Bible tells us Daniel was a man who understood science. He knew full well that pitch is made from tree sap and it's very sticky. They used to have whole industries in America just making pitch to use to uh, waterproof ships. They would coat them with pitch made from tree sap, particularly pine. And fat is very salty tasting and just about all animals like salty tasting things. The, the hunters put out salt licks for the deer, right, or cat, cattle have like salt licks. And hair won't digest. He mixed them all together Tossed them in, the dragon liked the taste, swallowed them, but they wouldn't digest. And these were the days before Roto-Rooter, and so he burst asunder. Mm -hmm. You figure it out. Anyway, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Hussein, thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. The guy has a serious ego problem. He thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar brought back to life. By the way, do you ever notice George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein? There's a reason for that. I've been told, anyway, the word Saddam means prince. Saddam, spelled the same way, means horse's rear end. <laughs> but Saddam thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. He's got his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar on their currency over there, their gold coins. He spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. Did you know ancient Babylon has been rebuilt? They always knew where the city was. It was destroyed about 600 B.C. But when Babylon was, they, you know, just buried in the sand, forget about it, they dug it out, and the sand had really preserved the bricks extremely well. 
The old brick walls of the ancient city of Babylon were very well preserved in the dry sand over there, and they found carvings of 